Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Just as a preface uh, for those of you who haven't had occasion to sit in on a, a session a session like this, I think we can all stipulate to the fact that we're extremely appreciative of the power, the imagination, and the capacity for innovation that's flying over everybody's head. It may be if I say the wrong thing, it comes down. But I think the, the, the uh, objective, the intention of these kinds, you can come up, why don't you come up to the front, yeah? Because the people are stuffed into the doorway. If you just, there's some seats in the front. Yeah, come on. You can always leave early if it's not interesting. Uh, anyway, uh, to, uh, to continue, I think the objective of these kinds of discussions which take place at SciArc periodically is to make an effort to analyze the work and to understand what it means, what it suggests, what the implications are for education in architecture and beyond education, what the implications are for design, engineering, fabrication, and construction. Uh, so, uh, Tom, you know, uh, Tom should introduce his team and then we'll, we'll, I'll ask a few questions and, and we'll have a discussion and I guess uh, at some point we'll arrive at the conclusion after which if there are questions from the audience we would be happy to uh, engage those as well. So. Thanks, Eric. Uh, yeah, let me just introduce the team first, um, and these, this isn't the entire team, a lot of the team is actually sitting in the audience, um, you know who you are. Uh, to my left is Matt Melnick from Barreau Happold, who's also an instructor here at SciArc uh, since about a year, I think? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. And Kevin Regalado on my left, who was a thesis student here uh, a year and a half ago, uh, works in my office, and Steve Boak. Uh, who works at Barreau Happold and, uh, and was responsible for most of the CATIA work on the, the project. Um, I, I, do you want to start, Eric, and ask a question, or should I? You you know? Yeah, I mean, this, this project started um, f for us as a, first and foremost, most as a, as a research project and not a sculpture. So it has certainly sculptural qualities and we can regard it in those ways, uh, which I, we certainly do and, and, and have in the office. Um, but it also has a whole other agenda, which is about um, the relationship between designers and engineers, uh, between engineers and fabricators, um, a lot of the hot topics uh, out there right now, and in a way how digital technologies can assist or also um, in case of uh, failure uh, actually frustrate. <laughs> we were talking about this today. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, it, it was an experiment really on the kind of simultaneity of engineering and design and how, you know, we can maybe work in a way that isn't about separating, isn't about one preceding the other, uh, but is more about a kind of um, a shared, uh, shared sensibility and uh, definitely not a shared use of tools. Um, we, we, we understand the difference between engineers and architects. Uh, that was a really interesting thing for us to kind of click together uh, uh, in a way where we have in our office a kind of sensibility about structure and that tends to be our primary interest in, in, in architecture. Um, but we don't have the, um, the ability to use the, the, the technical tools. Um, and that's where um, we, we really wanted to work with, um, with uh, an engineer like Burrow Happold, which is also not just about knowing how to use the tools, but also understanding everything that's behind the tools, having the intuition and the ability to um, uh, uh, think about adaptive structures and integrated structures like this one. Um, the project itself is based on dragonfly geometry. The, the interesting thing about dragonflies uh, is that it's not just a cellular geometry, it's a kind of hybrid geometry, which includes both um, 
uh, five, six, and seven-sided cells, which you can see towards the middle of the piece, as well as ladder-type geometry, which are four-sided cells and tend to orient themselves like uh, veins in the wing. Uh, the, the veins in this piece tend to orient themselves towards um, uh, the flow of bending forces. Uh, at the end of the day, you can't really break down the project into areas which are performing like membranes, which are identified by the, the location of the, of the Voronoi cells, or the, the beam-like action, which are located where you have the ladders. Uh, but it's a kind of uh, um, indeterminate force flow running through the entire project. And that was, um, again, a kind of source of, of interest for us and also frustration in trying to um, create a feedback loop between the engineering and the design, where we found um, sometimes we could make a minor change somewhere and have a massive uh, change in the performance of the piece. And um, other times, the changes that we made that seemed massive were actually relevant to the overall sti stiffness and stability uh, of the piece. So, um, yeah. No, I was going to, I thought you were finished. <laughs> well, I wanted to let Matt also. OK, so if you want to okay. add to that. Uh, yeah. Um, well, this was a, a, a rich project, and I would, it, Interestingly, it didn't begin as a project per se. It began as just a kind of um, talk that Tom and I had about what we liked and what we were interested in. And, uh, and then when the opportunity to do the gallery was uh, uh, presented to me, it seemed like a good, a good time to, um, to you know, do some research, try something new that you haven't done before. And, you know, the... The thing that interested me about this process was that it was that as engineers, we had an opportunity to really sit back and think about um, think about how it would be done and uh, kind of explore different you know ways of connecting these things together or assembling this or um, fabricating and and we kept running into kind of problems along the way that would have to be resolved but you know, the final solution was not determinate um, from the get-go. It really was a kind of meandering path that we had to take. And that's kind of exciting because uh, there's this constant, this, old, this ever-present sort of fear that, you know, is this going to work? Which is probably not the thing you want to hear uh, right now as you sit underneath it. But, you know, I assure you it does, it does work. Um, <laughs> the 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 challenge the challenge for myself and for for Steve and for uh, Ricardo sitting uh, on the side here was to not let to not let the um, kind of um, automated response take over and to not let our um, our trained uh, intuition interfere with the geometry that was happening and unfolding, and to kind of let it unfold in the way that was um, that would kind of satisfy, you know, it, this this the sculptural element and the kind of expressive element of it, and that that was frustrating at times to to not um, immediately jump to a conclusion, but to let things sort of sit and and. Uh, develop and unfold at their own pace. Thanks. You have to be a little bit careful when you listen to architects who, if they're good architects, are almost inevitably, and engineers, uh, extraordinary politicians uh, in discussing uh, their work. But I think inevitably there is some dichotomy between what's said and what's done. And the act of doing and the act of explaining what's done are not necessarily synonymous. Uh, so uh, with, with that in mind, let me just ask uh, a question or two, and we can start with Tom and see what members of his team have to say. The title, uh, it's probably easy to start with the title since they made a big point of calling this thing Dragonfly. And I think it's worth, it's worth mentioning parenthetically and certainly for students 
who stand up in front of a project and present it frequently and make the subject of the discussion the subject of what they're enunciating, meaning what's coming out of their mouth, so that what's on the wall to some extent, to some extent, comes to be what's explained by the architect. And sometimes that separates one or separates the work itself from the explanation and then one has to either deal with the explanation or ignore the explanation and try to find another language for talking about the content of the work. All right, for instance, if somebody, if, if, if somebody wants to call, and we have to talk about this briefly, a project, Dragonfly. So this immediately associates architecture and engineering with, with a very different subject. And it's fair to say, and it's, I think, important in my view, for your view, that there is no intrinsic connection in the world between dragonflies and buildings. Not an automatic law anywhere. So if somebody wants to make that case, we should be saying to them, okay, SciArc, we're interested. Tell us, convince us, teach us, allow us to understand. As, as, as a background to that, if you look at the history of discourse in architecture, uh, over the last hundred years or so. If you look at Le Corbusier's project in Algiers, which looks like it could have been done by Gris and Brock and Picasso. It's a cubist project. Or you listen to the argument that, that, that the Bauhaus people made, that buildings should be like cars coming off an assembly line. Or you listen to the arguments Tange and Kikutake and Kurosawa made that, that who were called the metabolists at a certain point, that architecture associated with the organization of the human body. And on into uh, the, the contemporary situation with Paul Demon and, and later Derrida to some extent who are literary critics, and all of a sudden architecture came to be about deconstruction, so-called, which was of course never an architecture movement, it was a literary movement. So the, 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 the first question is, why should we associate the conception of a wing of a bug with the building of space? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we, can, we can take the dragonfly literally and we can say, well, uh, this thing maybe has some some qualities of, of actually looking like a, a dragonfly wing. I, I hope that that's not the main impression uh, of the piece. That's not at all uh, the, the intent from our side. Um, I wouldn't say either that, that uh, biology as a discipline is intrinsically related to architecture, and I definitely wouldn't say that we're interested uh, in a kind of anthropomorphic or even biomorphic uh, architecture. But the fact is, biology is a, is a really nice way, analogically, into understanding uh, uh, the materiality in, in, in architecture. And, you know, I, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of second generation digital, I guess. Uh, first generation being piece, uh, uh, people who were interested in uh, the, the potentials of, of new forms. Uh, shapes, in particular, Greg Lynn, my my uh, my professor at UCLA, interested in external shape, uh, and um, I think now as we realize that the digital isn't just about um, special effects and isn't just about shape, that that there are other kinds of ways of understanding uh, digital tools in terms of. Uh, analytical tools, in terms of rule-based tools, uh, uh, algorithms, those kinds of things. Um, uh, basically, this this project is um, is about those things, and that's why you see it's not just a shape. It actually is all about engineering. And um, one thing I wanted to point out before is that, um, like the dragonfly wing, which has um, a, a kind of variable thickness of veins and of cell members, this thing does as well. Um, it, it varies from, from a single thickness in the very front to about seven thicknesses in the areas of the most stress. 
And that's not something that you'd immediately acknowledge as, as being about the shape, as being about biology or about bug wings. It's something about the accumulation and distribution of matter along a kind of network um, in response to particular loading conditions, in response to a particular length of, 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 of uh, cantilever and those kinds of issues, which to me are material issues and go beyond just a kind of um, uh, biomorphic I guess this thing, if you had to ask me, if, is it biomimetic, is it biomorphic, what is it exactly? I'd say it's definitely more bio, biomimetic than biomorphic. I, um, I, my, my father once quoted to me a, 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 a British uh, philosopher by the name of Bernard Shaw who said that every profession was a conspiracy against the public. Uh, <laughs> A present company accepted, of course. I think what I was getting to is if you said we're in a room, there's, there's an existing structural system in the room. There's steel pieces, there are concrete pieces, and so on. And that there is, there is a primary structure and a secondary structure. And the secondary structure is contingent on support points that exist in the primary structure which has nothing to do with a dragonfly, as far as I know, anyway. It's a different kind of problem. And you could discuss, the question is really, if you drop the dragonfly fly nomenclature and associated the structure with the installation of a piece that was secondary and had to make a whole series of connections, and by the way, you can see the connection. I mean, they reveal the connection. So somebody decided to open up the wall. You didn't have to open up that wall. You could have made that fastening to a hunk of concrete and left the drywall. Which, strangely enough, if you look at the fastenings just underneath the, uh, the parapet, where they decided not to open up the wall. So the metal studs you don't see, the concrete you do see, whatever, whatever the logic is of that. The question is, could we talk about the structure without reference to the dragonfly, does the dragonfly a distraction in the discussion and simply talk about a whole series of decisions that are made in order to install this piece as a consequence of, of, of other elements on which it's contingent? Yeah, I, I, I would welcome that. I mean, I, maybe this is a mistake. I mean, the question of a title is always a problem. I remember when, when we did PS1, uh, the same, I had a similar discussion with, with Alana Heiss, and yeah, in a way, the thing didn't need a title, and she insisted on something really lame that's kind of persevered now. Um, and I think you're completely right. I, 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 and at the end of the day, I don't want to talk about bug wings, you know? I think you, you, you know, hit the nail on the head. It's all about the contingencies. It's about localization. Uh, it's about variability, um, and and that's how we worked um, together, and and that's 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 the project. I mean, it was definitely not conceived of uh, um, uh, at, at the front end. It, it developed over time, um, and as as my friend Peter Testa just said, I was talking to him five minutes ago. Um, he just said, "Well, the, the interesting thing about this is that it also compresses." Uh, a sort of schematic design, design development, and construction into into a single into a single phase where it's all happening at once. You're building, you're learning, you're feeding back in that material knowledge. Uh, you're adding material. You're changing supports, which we did while we were constructing. Um, you know, uh, and and I guess th those are the issues that I would like to talk about, and not whether or not this this correctly, um, you know. Uh, uh, or you know whether or not this is uh, whether or not bug wings first of all have to do with architecture and whether or not this is a is an accurate representation of a bug wing. I, I, I don't want to talk about that. I mean, if that's your question. So you want to? I don't want to talk wings. about. It. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really sure how to respond, but the you know the thing that's really interesting to me about this project is that it is uh, highly specific, that it has, it has support locations that are, um, that are uh, so, um, that control or dictate the, the shape, the curvature, the behavior of, the, of this, this cantilever. And the, the geometry then is, is warped or uh, or is 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 morphs or uh, is somehow 
aligned with uh, the, the specific boundary conditions that it sees. And in that way, it's adaptive, and in that way, in that way, I guess it's like it's like a you know a biological system, um, you know. Biological systems are interesting because they are not always uh, you know pure optimization, um, you know minimum energy, pure form. I mean, there's a lot of um, biology kind of evolution kind of builds on artifacts or on on um, um, uh, you know, latents that 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 then determines um, you know the direction that something evolves in. It's not always based on um, you know survival. Well, survival of the fittest is kind of a you know a, um, um, something that you could debate at least what is fit and how do you define it. So in our case, fitness is standing up, um, and you know. The, the piece looks quite solid, but if I gave you one of these these plates, you'd see that they're really, really, they're really flimsy. Um, and the plates themselves have very little stability in and of themselves. So the interesting thing, or at least the process that we went through in finding or discovering this form was to f was to reconfigure the plates such that they balanced or or um, supported or propped um, themselves in such a way that this thing was stable. And so it, it really be, it's really a um, uh, the geometry really is a, is a critical component of of its ability to even function. And and that was um, that was extremely uh, you know that was an extremely challenging kind of component of this piece. Do you want to, yeah. yeah, it's certainly not a mandate to discuss the structural language or the architectural language of this piece in relation to the structure or design of a dragonfly wing, mainly because the dragonfly wing isn't unique in nature, um, if only that there are other insects that have the same structure, but it's fun. Um, it was the inspiration for the project, it was the inspiration for our structural design, and establishing a set of rules to make this thing stand up that felt like what was going on in the dragonfly wing was a lot of the fun of this, that near the supports you have more rectilinear panels, you have deeper panels. In the middle you have more kind of chaotic behavior with less dead weight. Um, you know, it was, it was all about developing this dialogue that made it feel like we were doing something biomimetic and it was interesting, if not required. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I hope we're not entirely talking past each other. Uh, it, I have a feeling that's that's going on. But I, uh, what if if what we're looking at is an investigation of a whole series of technical properties, secondary and primary. Why is it that, that there's no explanation for the investigation from a pedagogical point of view, from the investigation, the sketches, the diagrams, the studies, the evolution of the project, whatever the inspirational aspects of, of, of the wing, uh, so that people could understand what it is that you went through in order to arrive at this. And in, in the end, what it is that you did. I mean, for instance, if I extend a cantilever one centimeter, will it fall down? In other words, we're looking at cantilevers. Is that the longest you could go? In other words, what are the parameters in, in, in this context? What did we solve? Is it solved ultimately because of what it looks like or because of what it does as a structural achievement, meaning longer than anybody else has ever done? Because it's an investigation of a cantilever, actually. So what, is, what are we investigating? And how do we know, or how did you learn, and how do we understand what you learned just as a consequence of looking at this. 
Another way to, 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 to look at that, there have been for a long time questions of looking at structures and architects making arguments about structure and that structure and decisions in structure should be legible or intelligible or readable. And there's always a question of readable by whom. But to what extent is this legible, the intentions legible, the mechanism legible, or even the process of arriving at it legible? I, it reminds me, when, when, when I first took this job, we asked uh, uh, Monica Ponce de Leon to do an installation here, which was the repeat of one she had done uh, on the other side of the country. And it had to do with using ropes and compression. And it, of course, fell down. And we looked at that and we watched that and we, we recorded that. So you began to understand the limits of, of a, a tensile material used in compression. And ultimately, we got the thing to stand up, I guess, with a lot of glue or something. And, and so that, but the students who participated, who watched the process and, and saw it evolve, understood something very fundamental about what they were experimenting with and what they were learning. And again, the, the question is here, what did we learn? What we were looking to learn? How do we know? Does this communicate that? Or is it, in the end, just a particular kind of object? So what's the meaning of the object? Well, I, I don't know about the meaning. That seems like a different question than what you just asked. But the legibility? The structural yeah. legibility. I, I, don't know, I don't know if you're, you know, if you're, if you're trying to say that, that it's illegible you know, to you. Um, but for us, the, the fact that it's a rule-based um, uh, 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 strategy, the fact that um, we are dealing with a very strict set of a kind of a syntax which involves veining, which involves um, uh, uh, cells which have five to seven sides and which have which has cells that are, are four sided. Can I interrupt yeah. you for one yeah. second? Could you? Would everybody who knows what veining is raise their hand, please? All right. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, well, I guess we could also talk about, you know, the, the importance of it being legible. I mean, I'm not sure why it needs to be, uh, you know, ultimately completely transparent, uh, which is a different that, discussion. But, but if you want to talk to somebody, yeah. you've got to have a chance to, to, to well, move I the think, yeah. back and forth. And if you're using a language yeah. that they don't recognize, yeah. Yeah. and you want to say this is baiting, which sounds like a monopolist yeah. th argument, <laughs> then tell us what that I think the best, yeah, I, I actually don't think it's at all arcane, the, the, the things that we're talking about, and I'm sorry if, if it's coming across that way. Um, the, the fact of the matter is you can actually look around point by point on, on the project and describe what's going on, and I think Steve started to do that. Um, maybe I'll do that just for 30 seconds, just, just so that it's, it's really clear actually what's happening and that it isn't just a random um, uh, sculpture, which it's definitely not. Um, again, other than these two types of cell size, you have um, a vein we're defining as some, as a, particularly in a dragonfly wing, is an area where, uh, first of all, material aggregates. You have more material because it's trying to resist bending. So basically where you have a beam in the dragonfly wing is where you start to have quad-shaped cells, four-sided cells, and you start to have elements which are more linear than these kind of chaotic cells in the middle. So that's where you get a resistance to bending. Then, uh, so you see that here connecting to the existing steel, and you see that here connecting to the column in two places where it also delaminates to, um, to uh, 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 resist the bending at the, at the that tip. That has to do with cell shape, but it also has to do with the curvature. That's right. The, the curvature is the second thing in terms of the overall form. You notice that where we have curvature in the middle, it's, it's acting like a membrane, which means that um, it's not under bending. It's in plane forces only, and those forces are being distributed through the arch into the sides, um, into the beam elements. So that's, uh, that's the, uh, the membrane behavior. And then there are other areas which are, to me, the most interesting, um, particularly this, this little element here. There's a straight element which you can see running through the, uh, the cellular area. And that, that could be characterized as a vein. 
Um, but uh, it's really interesting to me because that's, that's a spot where we really, the engineering dictated that we needed to have some kind of a splice or a, or a, a vein-like element running through this, this chaotic membrane to stiffen and to connect the two sides, um, the, the two beam-like elements on, on either side. So you have a kind of hybrid moment, which was um, formerly my, my biggest interest in, the, in this project, where it's not a pure system. Um, it's not a hierarchical system of primaries and secondaries, but it's two c competing and, and uh, interrelated um, systems, one being the veining, the other one being the membrane action, um, in, a kind of, uh, in a kind of shaping environment. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, that for me the most interesting points are the, are the areas that you can kind of circle and say, okay, it's, it's neither one nor the other, it's kind of both, and it's, uh, yet it's, it's performing. And, and there was a definite attempt to obscure some of the structural language from this. We didn't want it to be obvious what was going on. That if you look at it carefully and you have some inside knowledge of the project, there is a pretty clear language, but hopefully it's not clear to everyone sitting here. I think that's useful, certainly in a school, to understand that because there's, there's an enormously complicated and if you're not careful, obfuscating use of language in explaining something that you don't want to be understood. And if you're trying to understand with a very exotic, esoteric explanation with associations to, to biological issues that you would have to look at pretty carefully in order to really test somebody and say, oh, I mean, somebody is telling you about dragonflies, and I don't know a goddamn thing about dragonflies, except they're quite beautiful. And, and maybe in the end, this is where the, the solution has to lie. But, but anyone who, who is intellectually curious about this process would have to be able somehow to test the arguments or to understand the arguments. So, so if, if, if somebody appears in front of you and says, this is the world and that's so, and we certainly see it in many contexts, including political contexts, and the first thing you, you learn to do is to duck under the table. You know, not so much in this case, but just in terms of, of, of discussing the meanings of, of what's done and how it should be understood and what, what your objective, uh, what, what you guys intended to do. I, I still think, I mean, the question of the cantilever is an interesting question. The question of the vault and the curvature, in other words, is that the maximum curvature? What did you push? What did you stretch? Because there is, uh, Guy did, a, did, did, did an exhibit which wasn't very appealing in a visual sense, but was very interesting in a conceptual way. So you understand, in a sense, the prowess you're recording or what, in a way, you're measuring, you know? Uh, because in the, in the end, I think otherwise people get very suspicious, and I'm very suspicious because I have the same problem that ultimately what we're looking at is an act of love, really, not an act of engineering. And that these guys knew damn well what they were going to make. And they wanted to make a certain kind of piece with a certain kind of language and a certain kind of vocabulary. So in a way, in my sense is, they knew at the beginning where they were going. They had a pretty cl clear idea of the destination. I think in, in uh, I don't know what would be a good analogy, but if you took Columbus who said, I'm sailing to India <clears throat> and wound up in Cuba, uh, this, this would be, in, in my view, truly, I understand it's not a precise analogy, more an example of what discovery might truly mean if you were looking and weren't quite sure how and where. And in that case, I, I think it wouldn't be so finished and, you, finished and you'd bump into things that you didn't expect to find. And there would be some recording of those things. So uh, again, I, my prejudice would be that, that, that 
the architects and the engineers had a pretty good idea the kind of object they wanted to make, the direction they wanted it to go, and a sensibility about what it would look like as a progressive piece of design and engineering. And that's what they made. Is that true or false? Structurally, the performance becomes clear as soon as you take your hand and try to push it sideways that it's not designed for that. And if one of us was able to reach up there and push on it, it would shake like a jello mold. And um, so the performance is stretched pretty thin and it's, it's pretty efficient. Um, you know, everyone sitting here, we're, we're all pretty comfortable with everyone sitting underneath it, but if those windows were open, um, that would be Columbus getting lost at sea and we wouldn't know quite what would happen. Uh, yeah, you know, it, I don't know if I know where you're going w w with this, <laughs> but I, I, you know. I, get, I get the impression you're... Yeah, I you're think, look, I get a lot of those guys did get lost at sea, is the, rea <laughs> is the reality. And, you know, you sail out and you don't come back. So that, it, theoretically, in an exploratory context, Wait. that ought to be an option. Let me just I was, I was gonna I was gonna say that they, this was definitely a an act of love, full blown. Uh, I think Tom, Tom and I are kind of um, you know geeky about geometry and technology and things like this, and so there was something appealing about the dragonfly in its complexity, in its, in, in, its, in its kind of beauty and complexity and also in its performance. And there was, um, you know, I, 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 would ch I would challenge or, uh, you know, I would argue that we didn't necessarily know where it was going when we started. Um, I would say we wanted something cool, and I believe the word was, was NASA. Was what? NASA. That was one of the, 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 des the descriptive That's funny, yeah. goals. NASA, as in National Aeronautics and Space Agency. That's the one. That's the one. Um, Tom actually worked for NASA, uh, short stint, summer internship, so they, he's... They threw me out. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so there was, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of fascination with geometry embedded in this as a kind of, um, uh, there's, there's a kind of, um, you know, passion for that, that was, uh, that electrified the whole project and sort of carried us through to this point. I mean, in a funny way, without that, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, I don't think, I don't think without the kind of the will power, we would, we, you know, because we, it, it just, the, then the scope of it, in terms of what this space is, and the, you know, all the constraints that we that are placed upon you in terms of you know time and money and all that other stuff, um, feasibility, fabrication, um, you know, it doesn't happen unless you really love it. I, I, yeah, I, I actually want to want to disagree. Yeah, that's great. I, I want to disagree with your intuition about the thing, Eric. That that you think that it came fully formed. There was some there's there there was some you know unconscious aesthetic there that 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 uh, uh, was preliminary to any kind of engineering exploration, and it's really not the case. Um, it, uh, in fact, even the cantilever itself, we discovered um, after some weeks of, of working on the piece that we decided we needed an unsymmetrical and extreme kind of loading scenario so that we could really test the stuff. We found out that if we started spanning across the room this way, that it wasn't as interesting, or if we came out a little bit and we had another arm over here. Um, so the cantilever even uh, it was nice a discovery. Would have been, that, by the way. Would what, have been the, great the to see the, yeah. the, the studies would have been extremely helpful because then you would be able to evaluate the result vis-a-vis -vis a whole series of options, which is always interesting in a design course. So you see what was considered and how it was tested and the conclusion you ultimately arrived at. You don't see any of that. 
So nobody where, knows. Where should we see it on? on the, All right, yeah. put it up on the wall. Okay. Try, show yeah, it. I, I agree. And, and in fact, um, in talking about the project, I just realized too that we need to um, put that material together. The, 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 well, the actual evolution of the piece, we need to, in a way, like find the history of that. But, um, but w w one more time, though, back to the idea of, of the thing just being sort of wholesale uh, uh, generated as a sculptural uh, piece, um, and th that being at odds with the kind of serendipitous nature of, of exploration. Um, this piece, in fact, um, is not just about the overall piece, but it's a very specific research um, into uh, uh, adaptive structures. And so, yeah, we knew already that there were going to be five and six-sided cells in it, and we knew about the veins, and we knew about all of that stuff. We defined it up front. Those were the rules. So, yeah, at, of course, at the end of the day, the piece is going to have some of, some of that sensibility in it. But the actual um, distribution of those cells, the size of the cells, the depth, and the connection to the space were not known. And, and uh, to me, um, that's, that's a kind of focused research as opposed to a kind of maybe uh, serendipitous or kind of, you know, uh, 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 happenstance uh, by chance kind of design process. So we really wanted to, um, to test out something particular, and we, we went for that. Well, I, I think ideally these kinds of discussions don't require the architects or the engineers to defend the project in a way. Um, I think it, what we're looking for is less defense and more elucidation or frankness <clears throat> or, or not so much I give you my case and you give me your case. I, it could have been, uh, for instance, <clears throat> and Monica's project was like this, that if a number of, of ideas were tried, that you hung up the number of ideas, either as models or you never finished. It was you tried this and it had this problem, we tried that and it had that problem. Because the gallery lends itself to that. Nobody says you have to finish at a certain time and present something as resolved. And if you actually, if, if, if your sense is that the subject matter is in the process of discourse and there is no resolution, then it would have been possible, and I think it would have been extremely useful to the audience to see other things that, that, that were tried. <clears throat> it, it, the, it, because the discussion, and I, I read the piece, I just read it uh, uh, this afternoon, uh, reminds me a little bit, you should, those of you who don't know the project should take a look at it, but you know Alto's uh, church, uh, in Imatra, Buxaniska Church, uh, which has a very peculiar section and looks like the kinds of things Alto makes, which can't be rationalized, I think, in a conventional kind of argument. So, you know, when you say to the client, um, why does it look like this way? And the answer is not normally, oh, we like dragonflies. So uh, probably not working. And what Alto did was to make a, an acoustic diagram uh, which nominally justified a very, in, anybody who knows just a modicum about acoustics knows it's baloney. It, it, it wasn't, it, it was about something else and certainly something very private and as part of his investigation that he carried out in the course of his uh, professional life. But it interested me only in the sense that I think in order to rationalize the project in the context of the discussions that were taking place at the time the project was done, he felt obligated to present a kind of analytical drawing which validated this very peculiar form as a response to an acoustical problem which he solved. And I think there was, for me, and I always remember that, because it's not that there was none of that in the discussion, but it seemed to me that it really avoided what was essential to the conception of the project. So this is, I think, as much about how the project is presented and argued and understood, particularly for this audience, this IARC audience, as opposed to what it is intrinsically, which might be something a little bit different. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I would hope that the piece 
uh, operates on its own. Also, in terms of the atmosphere that it creates in here, um, without necessarily needing the backup of a kind of of a kind of story or a history behind it, um, it does for me. It, it adds a lot of a lot of interest when I think about the history, uh, and I, maybe you know, there's a way to share that in here. Uh, uh, but I guess I would be also a little bit suspicious of something that, that needs a, a kind of diagram behind it um, to uh, legitimate it, and something that which, which doesn't operate on its own principles um, so in, a, in a spatial way. But he felt obligated yeah. to yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, and, and I guess we could have a discussion about, about history, you know, and, and what, what things, you know, uh, survive the test of history and what things don't. Maybe it's the things that have the diagrams and the, the content versus just the atmospherics because those are really hard to capture. Uh, in fact, I've been in here trying to photograph a few nights and it's very difficult actually to capture the, the piece the way it is. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I think a lot of these projects do end up being a kind of site plan later on and a diagram showing, you know, the performance criteria and that's how it, you know, that's how it's remembered, uh, particularly for a temporary piece. So. I think I've always thought that the best work is work that in the end you can't photograph. You have no chance. If you can photograph it, maybe it, it, it missed something. I think there is an issue here in a, in a different category of, of discussion, in educational and professional discussion, that has to do with the relationship between design, concept, engineering, engineering drawing, CATIA, building information modeling, uh, uh, fabrication, or mocking up pieces, and then ultimately building and installing. And it might be useful to, to hear a little bit specifically, and it sure would be would have been useful. I know I've said this three times, but but to see the chronology of models, drawings, and exchanges between uh, architects and engineers, so you really got more of a sense of of the pushing and pulling in the project. It reminds me uh, a few years ago we invited uh, Guy Nordenson to give a talk. And he had worked on a project uh, with Stephen Hall at MIT and made a very interesting drawing, which actually had to do with that big Verendale wall and colors and all of that, which, which the architect then expropriated. It didn't belong to the architect at all. It belonged to an analysis by an engineer. And the architect grabbed onto that and actually installed it quite literally on the wall of the building. And to see that, I think we had Guy talk first and then Stephen came and talked about it and the two stories, you know, you have to listen to both stories and they weren't, in t and, and they complemented each other. And I think it was useful for the audience, useful for the students to understand that interrelationship. And in, in a way, you have a team like that here. Uh, what you don't have is, is evidence of the nature of the exchange and the modeling techniques and so on. So maybe just to wind up on this end, you, you guys could talk about that a little bit, how it worked and how inf information went back and forth and, yeah. Yeah, there was, a, there was a stark contrast between the way this thing was designed and the way it was built. The four of us and everyone else that worked on this project were mainly designers and when it came to building this thing, we didn't have the kinds of tools and skills. And um, I mean, we modeled it in the computer with about as much technology as we could you know, find. But it was built with very rudimentary technology. We approached fabricators and manufacturers with the technology to build this a lot more efficiently than it actually was. And their doors were shut. So if we ask Kevin about the nights that he spent outside with a skill saw, um, you know, this thing actually did get built in a sort of different generation of technology than it was designed. Um, and it was really amazing, actually, the, the skills that came out of the woodwork. The, the modeling was probably the most advanced part of it. We used a piece of software called CATIA. You might know it as Digital Project. And it's a fully three-dimensional parametric modeler. Um, the explanation of that would probably be too long-winded, but it allows us to very quickly modify a design that we've created. And that was sort of the intent, that we would start with a design that Tom gave us, and we would tweak it subtly to make it stronger and to perform a little bit better. And in the end, it actually did work that way. In, in what form did the design arrive to you guys? 
Maya or IGIS was the, the file format that we were using to exchange information. And it, well, it, there was a bit of reverse engineering that um, the model came to us as IGIS, which is geometry that we can't tweak easily. It's, it's what we would call dead. So we had to reverse engineer the model in Katia, which allowed us to make it parametric and live so that we could edit it. Again, the sort of a full explanation of that process would be far too long-winded, but... I don't think the details okay. are interesting so much as parametric in a conceptual way isn't so complicated. Okay. For, in a technical way, it's complicated. But just okay. the association of pieces, so if you raise right. the ceiling, the beam goes like this. Okay. Like, you know, it's so okay. the interrelationship of parts, I think, is, is yeah. a useful piece of the discussion. Earlier today, we were trying to prepare a little... Uh, animation that showed that exactly that that we actually had these kind of control points at each intersection of panels at each node we had a point and if we move that point in space the way that this was ultimately built is that it was modeled as a single continuous surface in 3d from there each panel was rationalized so the points that there are multiple panels overlapping at a single spot that was all done in 3d in the computer and if we the panels are then prepared for manufacturing. That the way they were actually built was we took a 3D piece, flattened it, cut it out on a mill, and then bent it into into shape. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the nice the nice part of the modeling is a lot of people did. Um, when your budget is zero, they don't flock to you. I mean, the, the, we, you know, when, when, I, yeah, yeah, we, when I look at the piece, actually, it's great that you brought up these control surfaces, because there seem to be, if you, you know, anybody who's used three-dimensional software, if you just look at this thing as a series of lines and points, it's actually pretty, it's pretty hard to control. There's a lot of information. But if you look at it, like the way I, I look at it, is as a kind of continuous surface where you don't have, uh, you, you have handles, in a way, that you can control a massive amount of information with very few control points, um, it, it becomes a much more fluid fluid uh, uh, thing. And it's much easier to make changes, which are, is really f was for us the most important thing if we want to consider this thing an adaptive structure. But those, um, but, but those organizational points representationally are not organizational points visually. In other words, what it takes to organize the drawing in a conceptual way is not legible in the, in the installation in a visual way. They could be. Well, the, 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 the thing that is actually legible, the, the, the Katia um, uh, element, are the, the inscriptions that we put on each individual piece, which we, uh, we, we liked for, uh, for two reasons. One, if, if people notice on the individual pieces there, there's a part number, which is obvious, a part number to keep track of parts, um, but which is, uh, there's something a little less obvious, which is the number nearer to the seam. And so you see 120, 103, 84, 102. That's basically the angle at that joint. So uh, basically, each, each element is inscripted with an angle number. That angle number was scripted out of Katia so that, um, so that, and, and automated, so that Katia knew what the angles were, and those were, um, those were automatically put onto the pieces, right, without this us having is, to measure way, the angles. This is the machine talking to itself and organizing itself parametrically, but when somebody who doesn't know that mm -hmm. looks at that, it's a little bit, I don't want to give it too much credit, but it's a little bit Rosetta Stone-ish in a way, because you don't know what you see is a whole series of significations. And to some extent, when I looked at that, I thought part of the intention was actually to take something which is extremely legible as a computer model and make it utterly illegible as a visual model. You got all these numbers and codes flying around. It's the Da Vinci thing. Nobody knows what the hell it is, except that it has some meaning, but you can't read it. You know. So again, I mean, there there is probably a way. We did a piece recently. There are a whole series of beams. There are a series of sticks that go between the beam. Each stick is different as it goes through the space, and they're numbered, but they're numbered in a, chron a chronological way. 
So you could understand, assuming you can count either forward or backward, and it's a mile high and you can... Be but, but there is a question about whether the language of fabrication, which becomes part of the installation, is understandable to people who will look at it. Actually, since you mentioned it, a lot of the structural language is visible right on the panel. So the panel names all have a two-character prefix and a two-character suffix. Um, it's for the one I'm looking at, it's B3 underscore 58. So there were three components of this model. There's actually, sorry, there are more than that. And I think Kevin would be better to speak about that than me even. But those two characters in the beginning are, they basically identify the zone that it's in. There's a zone that's near that support at the column. There's a zone of kind of dead weight in the middle. There's a zone of support on the, on the other side. And then the second two characters, the last two characters, kind of identify its position. And I but, think yeah. if you work front to back. But I, I think there. The, I, but nobody the, knows yeah. that. Yeah. I think right, it would right. be the yeah. point. And then the right. question is there's a load of technical information related to a drawing process, which is, which is a, in a way, a discussion among initiates, you guys being the initiates, and nobody else you can guess at it. And you can start to understand it. I looked at it and I couldn't figure it out. And I had no idea. Except that one understands sizes of pieces. Of, and, and the association of the, of the nomenclature with the support points is something that actually could be. I mean, as you said initially, you didn't want it to be so obvious what was going on. I think that's extremely successful. And even the graphics reinforce that actually, by putting up a whole series of signs that you can't read. Yeah, it, you didn't it, have to yeah. show those. You could theoretically, you could have taken exactly. it all off. Yeah, exactly. We, we actually liked the look yeah. of the numbers. I mean, they're there not for that reason. They're there so that we don't get the parts mixed up and so that people know how to build the thing. Um, also, without kind of traditional construction documents, which was which was an interesting concept for us, that you could work locally, that you could, if you just had, if you just received a box full of parts, you could start building the piece just with the information embedded on the on the individual sheets, and that was definitely interesting for us. But at the end of the day, it's also a, you know part of the overall atmosphere of the piece, and and yeah, and we we liked it. Oh, so. Ricardo just reminded me that the entire numbered diagram is actually on the poster in the back in plan, the black and white sort of. Uh, view of it shows it, it doesn't specify the language, but it does identify the numbers. Yeah. yeah. It, the um, I thought it was pretty amazing as we as we built it because the 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 fabrication when you when you when you cut the plates there um, you see them as two um, you know two dimensional flat plates. They don't they don't have any um, three dimensional you know, configuration, and then you bend the plates, um, and you're reading off of a, a, a 2D diagram that tells you where the plate goes, and you connect it to another one, and then you connect that to another one, and in a, in a really kind of surprising way, uh, the, the curvature, you know, comes out of that, falls out of that process, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, pro it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's a step-by-step -step systematic process where, whereby one doesn't need to know what the final configuration is. They only need to follow the process, and then there you go. Bam! There's the, there's the curvature, um, and it's as you know, it's, it's complex. I mean, you you don't have to measure angles. You don't well, you measure in-plane angles, but you don't have to measure any kind of variation in in in, uh, in the in the in the vertical plane. So it's, I thought that was quite fascinating. I just wanted to say one thing, Eric. It seems like you, 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 kind of uh, unconsciously want to bring this thing back to a discussion of meaning, and uh, and and uh, I guess uh, uh, no. It seems like that's how you look at the piece, <laughs> and that's that sort of was not one of our interests. I guess we weren't we, we weren't necessarily interested in how uh, the piece would be perceived. Uh, I guess you know culturally, or I guess it's kind of uh, you know we're more interested in, in the the atmospherics of the thing, the kind of effect of the thing. On the one hand, and on the other hand, the 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 the, the performance and the process. Uh, so I don't know if that sidesteps meaning. I don't know if it if it just uh, you know avoids meaning. I don't know wh you know wh exactly what. But it, uh, it's a different kind of a discussion than than what does the piece as it stands here uh, m mean. 
Well, I think we talked about a lot of a lot of aspects of what we're looking at, and I think what what I'm interested in is that that the community that participates in this participates in the discussion in as intimate way as as in an intimate way as is possible which i think requires some openness and some frankness and i think the 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 understanding of of what was done and the aspirations and the ambitions i mean clearly there are a whole series of technical associations and linguistic associations and biomorphic associations it's loaded with meanings not to say numbers and codes and all of that uh, and I think I think we touched on that. I think what we didn't talk about uh, so much, and I think in the end may be as important uh, for this audience, uh, is that I think it's an it's it's an act of of perseverance and patience and courage. And I was trying to it's it's cunning. The project, I think, it's 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 cunning. It's not it 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 is what it is, and it is something else. And I think I, what I was trying to find a way to get to is 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 a little bit more frankness in understanding why it is what it is and what it uh, aspires to. But I think I think the the perseverance and the courage uh, to implement this, I think, is important to us, and I think it's one of the more unusual pieces in the in the uh, uh, short history of the gallery. Um, is there is there anyone in the audience who wants to uh, jump into this, chime in on this? was we decided that the walk by up above on the catwalk was was the more important viewpoint for the project than down here uh, because of the you know people don't really come in the gallery after the opening uh, unless there's a talk um, so we we, we uh, really went out of our way to make sure that the um, uh, that the views and the, the lighting uh, was hitting it just right, um, that, that the thing would kind of um, be substantial during the daytime, but then also start to dissolve into this patterning of, of, of light and, and reflections um, at, at night. So I don't know if that, if that answers your question. Yeah. You mean of the design process? Well, well, we were we were also restricted um, uh, by uh, well, we had a lot of restrictions, um, but one of the main ones is is uh, the economics of the piece, um, and we we did a kind of metric at the beginning of the piece about how much aluminum we could buy with the with the budget that that we had, and um, after some calling around, that defined itself pretty clearly how many sheets. I'm not going to say that we stayed within that number <laughs> completely, but but part of that metric also involved the amount of, uh, of of recycling at the end of the project. So if we recycle it, we actually get back um, uh, uh, some of the investment in the piece, and it ends up um, you know uh, uh, hopefully equalizing. So um, one of the you know how, how do you stop it? How do you keep it from growing over there? How do you keep it from getting even deeper or even larger? That that was a really big thing. Is we knew we had so many square feet of material. We had 1,400 square feet of aluminum. Uh, which is about, you know, 70 to 80 sheets, uh, and, and that was a huge defining element. Um, that was also one of the reasons why we decided to go for something which is all web and no flange. Uh, if you notice, it's all vertical webbing. Um, if we had had flanges, it would have been a whole different animal. We would have had a lot of more folding in this direction. Uh, it, it wouldn't have been possible to have so much volume with so little flat material. So that, that was important. We, the question... Uh, oh, yeah, go cool. I mean, structurally, we, uh, the bell rang on us. We, we did a lot of analysis, to, obviously, to make sure this thing would stand up. But towards the end of the process, we did start to begin these much more advanced studies of optimization and how the play of the shape 
and the size of the panels and all that could be varied and improved to minimize the material going into this thing, that there, the only consideration on this project was the cost of the material. It was free labor from all of us. It was a time schedule that we thought was pretty generous. So it was all about bringing the cost of the material down. And we had set up some, some, I'm proud to say, pretty advanced studies of this thing. But in the end, we didn't get to run enough of them. There were, there were studies set up to study the vault height of that middle kind of arch. There were studies of depth of panels and how they vary across the section in, in each direction. And, um, and in the end, we, just, we didn't have enough time to really you know, eliminate every extra inch of aluminum. But um, we did pretty well, I think. One, I, I think uh, if you didn't hear the question, the question was what's the stopping point? And it just for me personally, um, I'm always a little bit uncomfortable with somebody who says the clock did it, the bank did it. I think the, um, you know, for students who stand up and say, and I think very frequently when, when a student says this, there's a rebuttal. Gee, it would have been fantastic if I only had another two nights or two weeks or whatever it is. And all of us know, in fact, that those arguments have validity to actually sow in a way. And yet everybody else had the same constraints. I think the real interest in the question is not what is the stopping point in terms of the number of sheets or the, the calendar but what's the conceptual stopping point, which has to do with what are the objectives? Back to the question of is, is it the longest cantilever, the thinnest? Why is material an issue at all? Is, is the objective to use the least material or the material most efficiently or the most material? And without understanding those ideas, simply saying we had this many sheets and this many dollars and this much time, I think, again, avoids the, the essential point about the technical or poetic objectives of the project. In other words, where, where do you think you're heading? What was the goal? What did you want us to see or to feel or to understand? Did you get there? I mean, in the end, is, is, is the project successful or not? Tell us that. And I think in some ways the, the, the question, the implications of the question are somewhere in there rather than time and, and money. Vegas. Yes. Uh, God, we're still exploring. Yeah, of course, all the time. Don't stop. Um, not, 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 not to, not, not necessarily a to uh, some kind of greater depth with this particular system. At least not at this point. I think, um, I think there's an applicability here for larger scale. I think the, the, the fabrication, the fabrication uh, enables a kind, of, a kind of freedom and a kind of, kind of specificity that is difficult with, um, with cutting and, and welding plates together. So I would be very interested to take this another step further and, and look at something larger and actually and actually look at something that's permanent. Um, I have a question for yeah. Yeah. Eric, the handmade and the sort of very sophisticated design tools. If you had an entirely new way of applying the money in your projects, would you still have to prove to the uncertainty of the handmade installation? No. Yes. Yes, absolutely. The only the only thing stopping us what what is yeah, well, the, the last thing you said? I'm sorry. It's 
We did build a scale model of it to mainly to see how all these panels would line up when it was actually built to see if there were any unexpected effects. Uh, in fact, there are some. And even now, structurally, we're still studying it. There are some things happening that we didn't fully anticipate. And yeah. we, yeah, we certainly want to look at that more. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to, I don't know if this is going to answer your question, but I'd just like to talk for a second about optimization, because Matt, Matt's brought it up, and we didn't really talk about it that much. But it's something that's, that's really fresh uh, in the engineering field, and um, some people are using it. Um, uh, other people are not, but people who are using it, there, there's, a, there's a, a wide range of, of applications. Um, a lot of times, the idea of optimization comes from clients or construction managers, people who are trying to save money, um, where you basically take a structure, let's say an overall shape, and you try to, you try to structure it in a way that, um, that uses the least amount of steel uh, and least amount of, of labor um, to reduce the price of the thing that you want to have. Um, and one thing that we had endless discussions about on this piece were um, how can optimization be uh, how can optimization begin to be a, a generative kind of thing? How can we expand it um, from just fine tuning between, let's say, if you look at um, at, at Norman Foster's uh, 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 what's it the, the King Court project, which Burrow Happold actually did, where where it went from a kind of design sketch, the arching was about like this, and the optimization routines which were run on it uh, made it about like this. Um, so what we were looking for in this project is more than just a kind of uh, a micro tuning uh, of structure, but more like how can we use optimization in these new softwares, uh, including ANSYS software, uh, which we hardly got running, um, but how can we use this kind of software to actually have some kind of overall repercussion on the, um, on the impact, actually, uh, of the piece and on the architecture. And that's something that I, I want to continue to research uh, with, with Burrow Happold. Um, and it involves not just a kind of intuition, but it involves it involves very specific tools, um, uh, digital tools, and uh, and it involves a kind of uh, savvy w with those tools, um, uh, which um, you know w we don't have access to in, in my office, um, and you guys are just learning. But I think that it's a huge field opening up now um, uh, in in architecture and engineering. Um, I don't think that answers your question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But I, I mean, I think, Chris, if, if you didn't hear the point, the point seemed to be that on one hand, the engineering, the representational techniques are pretty sophisticated, and the implementation uh, techniques were 19th century or something. And was that a function of what was available to these guys, or is there something in the exchange of, of a certain capacity to 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 draw and to calculate related to a more handmade conception of implementation because of obviously the project carries that and looks like that but i think tom's answer was no if he had his choice it would have been fabricated and they would have would would not have uh, which, is, which is still a handmade yeah right, right. Uh, one too, one point about this optimization again I, I, this is just me, and, and you're certainly entitled to feel differently, but I have a terrible time with a lot of this jargon. Because, hell, if you wanted to optimize, you'd never build this anyway. I mean, so come on. I mean, so, so you're optimizing in, in, in a context where complex pieces are accepted, and within the acceptability of a complex structure, there's then an issue of optimizing in order, within the context of accepting something which is clearly not optimum. And I think just to say we're optimizing, again, doesn't explain the context in which that discussion takes place. It obscures it. I wanted to go actually go back to the question a little bit, because you kind of stipulated in the question that time and money were not the only things stopping us from manufacturing this with better technology. From our end of, of things, I thought they were the only two things stopping us. But um, I was going somewhere else with this, but I forgot. Uh, I, 
Um, the, I have one, a de it, something that seemed like a detail at the beginning, which actually has a huge uh, impact on the piece, and that's the bolts. I, I hate the bolts. I hate the bolts. They, it's, it turns the thing a little bit into uh, the Eiffel Tower to me, speaking of the 19th century. I absolutely hate the bolts. We talked about adhesives. Um, you know, I, 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 th there are definitely other ways to, to do the piece, but um, th that's, that's the kind of very prosaic uh, um, acceptance of the fact that this thing is going to be um, uh, built um, uh, at school here with minimal tools and with unskilled labor and um, and and that we're going to have to build it in small pieces so that we can lift it up frankly it's about the way the weight of the individual pieces so um, yeah I mean if we could have you know 3d printed it at full scale out of out of solid aluminum that would have been nice but you know what's the, the Columbus landing in Havana argument is, is a little bit related to you have to do it by hand and you have to use the bolts. And, and for me, the, the ability to go forwards and backwards in concept as opposed to a kind of allegiance to something which is the ultimate statement of progressive technology as an ideal meaning you can't show bolts, why not? Aside, why not? Because this is the way they did it 150 years ago. Why can't you use something somebody did 150 years ago in combination with something that somebody did 150 years later? Got no idea. Don't know, I could make the opposite argument. So, they, they, I mean, this is, this, is, this is a kind of, in, in its own way, a sort of progressive ideology which argues for a certain kind of consistency. And in fact, the result shows, and my guess is in one way or another, even if it was implemented on a large scale, which is, which is an interesting challenge, that it would have some of those inconsistencies. And if you look for those things and you understand those things and you're not glued to the 23rd century and you're not glued to the 15th, I think you got a better chance, actually. Because then ultimately whatever you do is dated according to the terms that you set out for yourself. Next year there'll be a different kind of glue. And then you'll be old fashioned. I, In I, your terms. I would. The, um, if we could have had it made by someone else, that would have been fantastic. Uh, a lot less hassle. And, and that, that, would, that could have been one approach. Uh, but I thought what was really fascinating about, uh, what was really fascinating about this process was that we were given the constraints we were given, particularly related to the fabrication. And for instance, the choice of aluminum was made because we could only mill at Cyarc, and we had a we had a, a mill that could cut through aluminum but couldn't cut through steel. I would have preferred steel uh, as as a material choice. Now the end result is 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 gorgeous, and I think the aluminum catches light in a way that that steel would not have, um, and adds a kind of preciousness to the. To, to the piece, but those constraints were very apparent from the beginning, and that was that was interesting. To that, and starting with those constraints and un trying to understand how to solve them became motivators or drivers for for understanding what geometry we could even was even feasible. What, what geometry can we capture given this template? Um, one of the one of the concerns or one of the challenges with bolting things together is. Um, or this kind of cellular, cellular geometry is how do you find continuity between cells? How do you join them? Um, and so, you know, we went through a number of different iterations of how we might do that. Uh, in some of those iterations, we actually considered using additional material. Uh, could, you, could you pop rivet it? Can you rivet it? Would have been a hell of a lot smaller a presence. The, yeah, the, I wouldn't even yeah. know how to do that, but that, yeah. The, the, the reason, one of the reasons we didn't at the end of the day was that we needed the adjustability of the bolts. 
um, uh, which we really needed as we noticed, as we started to build outwards, it started to sag towards the front and we needed to um, pull it back. I think some people saw some straps pulling it back. We had to loosen the bolts and retighten them. And that's just, um, you know, the, I guess when you start at one corner and start building towards another corner, you, you get a kind of um, inaccuracy that builds on itself. So having the bolts actually um, was, was very useful in getting back to the original shape, which was important not just aesthetically, but also um, it, we had to accurately um, uh, reflect the engineering of the piece. So we wanted to get it back into its, its shape. But uh, by that logic, I would, uh, my suggestion was to rivet it, to pop rivet it. If you don't like the appearance of the bolts, this would certainly reduce the appearance of the bolts or the presence of the bolts. And the response is that the bolts actually were an essential technical component of the installation. You heard what Tom said. It, it, it allowed these guys to, uh, to adjust the piece across a fairly substantial dimension. But that in and of itself, of course, is a part of the criteria for understanding what it is and how it was made. And by the logic of that installation, you would argue for the, for the presence of the bolts because they mean everything to the capability uh, or your capability to build it. In which case, if you say the bolts shouldn't be there, then what you're saying is the mechanism that allowed you to build it shouldn't be understood or shouldn't be part of the visual aspect of the project. And then you go back to the other discussion, which is we don't want you to get it. We don't want you to understand it. We want it to be a little bit more enigmatic. So I think you have to decide maybe what exactly the game is, whether the, 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 the consequence of the fabrication and the installation required the bolts and that's good because that's illustrative of what it actually took to implement it, or in an idealistic sense, in a different construction mechanism, at a different scale, you would take all of that away, in which case you're actually making a model, not a literal piece of structure, but you're making a model at a small scale of something you want to deliver on a large scale. So this is a surrogate for another idea, which is different. In other words, this is what it is because it, it was built the way it was built, or it is what it is because it has to look like something that would be built differently. Yeah, I don't think it has to be either or. And I, it, it's, it's neither just a representation of a process. I don't think this thing's working. Yeah, it is. Sorry, it wasn't close enough. It's neither a representation of a process nor uh, uh, just the thing, or or, or it's uh, it's 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 affect. Uh, it's 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 both. And so I I feel good about saying I don't like the bolts while still uh, um, understanding the reason why they're there. Um, it, it's not a contradiction to me at all. I just don't like the bolts. I'm glad you feel good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. The book, the, the, um, um, anybody else? Yeah. I have a question up here in the corner. We've been talking about the meaning of words along the way, and I'm interested in discussing word performance, because that has been used a lot, word performance. Um, and I think by default, uh, we've talked about it in the sense of structural performance. But I'm more interested asking you your take on this as sort of like performance art or an act of performance because I see it's you know very heavily lit it's concerned with the shadow and the atmospherics and um, it's almost a very sort of self-conscious piece that is suspended in um, a dramatic act at the moment so I see it I can almost say that it's an actor and I and I have to say I enjoy his performance. Um, how how would you respond to seeing it that way? Well, I, I don't know about the, the, the theater metaphor. I, I don't know quite what to do about that, uh, how, how to help you out you, there. You, you've lit it in such a way that yeah. it's hard to not read it theatrically. Yeah, which is precisely my point, what I just mentioned to Eric a second ago, that, that at the end of the day, we, you know, we're, we're interested in the process, and this is where we feel like we are actually contributing 
the, by doing the research and trying to figure out new ways of, 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 of creating adaptive structure. But that's not to say that, that we don't care what comes out at the back end. It could be anything. It could be, you know, it could be a donkey. It could be a head of lettuce, you know? It, we, we were definitely in control as designers of the piece as it evolved. Uh, we weren't just at the mercy of, of, uh, of, of iterative analysis and feedback. Um, and so I, I guess that's you know that's to say that this isn't this isn't just a kind of this isn't just a performance piece. The, this it's it's a it's a um, it's a piece of research um, as well as a design object. So I, I mean I don't know you know if, is it a player is this where's the backdrop I I don't know how to how to respond to that to that question. Um, you? Well I'll try. Yeah I'm an engineer but I'll try. The uh, the soul of this thing is in it. it. It's in the way it's built. We had, half of them are in the room right now, and actually, if you guys could raise your hands, the SciArc students that helped build this thing. The reason that all these bolts are there is because the SciArc students put them there. Um, it was built that way because it's the only way we could build it, and it took a really long time, and that's what makes it special. It was hard work. Um, it was hard work, and it was dedicated work. We had a very large, very dedicated team, and they put it together. Um, yeah. You know, it's I, I actually it when you make yours, when you make your installation, I think you're bumping into something which has to do with a group of characters who put a hell of a lot of time, energy, will, perseverance, commitment, love, all of that. And it's, it's hard to, in a way, dispassionately connect them, disconnect them from whatever their predilections, loves, allegiances are, and to say, wait a minute, there are red lights flashing on this thing. That has an intention. It has a meaning. It suggests a way that the project would be perceived that is not talked about at all. I mean, clearly, if you wanted to explicitly to light critical joints, critical space, critical pieces. So you wouldn't do that with a red light, I don't think, in this way, with a lens like that. You might do it with a red light if it were a laser and say, look at this point, look at this point, look at this point. Like, don't you get it? Here are the points. But, but the terminology, this atmospheric discussion, is a fair point actually because it because it has consequence in the space and as a kind of environment which which i which it does and i think that the 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 student is asking you to understand it from that perspective which i think doesn't sound like it's your perspective except you're the guys who put the red lights up why'd you do that <laughs> Maybe somebody else did it, I don't know. Anyway, one more and then let's, yeah, you wanna? How would you five describe this one word? Uh, one word I think would be more attention to humor than accuracy. Um, <laughs> um, Have to be one word. <laughs> Please, no. You can, you can say yeah. no. Yeah. I would say dumb. <laughs> Just because I mean I was involved in mainly the construction part of it, and the whole time was basically trying to dumb it down as much as possible. So dumb. So dumb. I would say collapsing. Um, I noticed when I walked in tonight that I can almost touch the, the nose of it. Um, it was designed, uh, I think, about 36 inches higher than that. Um, uh, yeah, no, it's... It, it, sorry, <laughs> sorry, man. Um, but uh, due, to, due to the fact um, that, that it's not actually... Uh, it, it wasn't built by NASA, that, that there's a lot of inconsistencies in the way it was constructed, um, the load pads are not actually 100% um, where they should be, so the overall piece has some, def some unexpected deflection in it. And it's been pretty interesting to watch the thing um, uh, sinking a little bit, but it seems to have stabilized where it is right now. Thank you, thank you very much. Everybody okay? Thank you very much for your patience and
see you again soon. And, and thanks very much to Tom and, and, and his team for an exceptional piece of work and an unusual discussion.